Connections uh, webinar that you're in tune to. And Universal Family Connection is a full-fledged social service agency. We're sitting on the south side of Chicago. We have two locations. We have one in the Beverly area, and we have one in the Auburn Gresham area. And today's uh, webinar um, is being collaboration with the Black Women Supporting Empowering Lifestyle Factors, excuse me, work group, um, excuse me let, me, let me say it again, that phone tripped me out. Uh, today's webinar is being sponsored by Black Women Supporting Empowering Lifestyle Factors. And the work group, what they did, they met twice a month for hmm, two years, this is the third year. And this third year is where they develop and now they're implementing their structural intervention. And the name of the structural intervention is Our Power, Our Voice, Our Control. Our Power, Our Voice, Our Control supports Black women with health and wellness discussion featuring Black female medical doctors and other Black clinical providers via monthly Zoom webinar on shared lessons with the latest COVID-19 information to help us to survive the pandemic while addressing systemic factors that continues the HIV epidemic and other health disparities in the black communities. And as I said, this is gonna be a 12 month series. So we're gonna have a series of topics on discussions such, such as HIV, PrEP, PrEP is pre-exposure prophylactic, uh, hepatitis, mental health resources, and creating a self-care toolkit for black women. And so our program is geared towards black women, as you can see, and, and it's also gonna be led by monthly discussions with black female doctors. Um, and just a brief overview, um, the Black Women Supporting Empowering Lifestyle Factors Work Group, they are comprised of black and African women. And they came up with a structural intervention that will address uh, systemic racism surrounding women who are HIV positive and women who are HIV negative as it relates to the healthcare. And so we did a um, 100 plus panel discussion with black women on the north side, west side, south side and east side of Chicago. And it was and found that there is systemic racism in healthcare as it relates to black women. And that's, and that's why they're not achieving viral suppression if they were HIV positive. We also found out that Black women didn't know about PrEP. PrEP is a program that can prevent HIV from happening. We also found out we wanted our own uh, marketing material. And so that's why, thanks to Dr. Brittany Martin, we have such marketing tool available that we're utilizing. So it's like a for you, by you as well. And then we also can put up a Dr., um, Dr. Clark's marketing media kit and I have for that to the Chicago Department of Public Health as well as our evaluators at Northwestern uh, Memorial Hospital. Okay, so, but thank you all. Thank you for coming in. And this is a webinar format. And I know some people used to just tuning in and getting on the video, but this is gonna be a structured uh, 12 month series. So thank you, thank you. And then Dr. Clark, uh, are you, were you ready to go? Yep, I'm ready. Okay, well, I'd like to thank you, uh, Dr. Crystal Clark, for being, um, leading the discussion as a black medical doctor on women's, uh, black women's access to healthcare. And the title of your discussion, session is Women's Mood and Anxiety Disorders Across the Reproductive Life Cycle. So let me tell you something about Dr. Crystal Clark. She's an associate professor of psychiatry and behavioral health science. And she has a secondary appointment in obstetrics and gynecology at Northwestern University, Feinberg School of Medicine. She is a board certified in adult psychiatry. Dr. Clark's expertise includes the treatment of mental health in women broadly across the lifespan and specifically as it relates to the diagnosis and treatment of mood and anxiety disorders affected by hormonal changes 
during periods such as pregnancy, postpartum, and menopause. She is the president of Marcy of North America, an organization focused on advancing advocacy, clinical care, education, and research for childbearing women and their families. So I'd like to thank you. I, like I said, I am very excited that you are leading this discussion in this time of the pandemic as it relates to black women. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Clark. All right, thank you, Juliet. Um, so I'm glad to be here with everyone. I have a passion for sharing information about mental health, um, particularly to black women. I think um, because we don't get enough education about it, and we really, you know, no matter what you're dealing with, no matter, no matter what you're going through, um, we, we need help too, you know. So um, it's a passion of mine to be able to communicate and educate my Black women about things they should be looking out for, especially as it relates to their mental health and other areas of wellness. Um, I've had the um, honor of working with HIV um, infected women over the course of my career. And I can't say enough about how important it is to maintain your mental health, you know, in dealing with that illness and, and caring for yourself throughout the, um, the course of that illness so that you are uh, taking care of yourself and living the best you can. Um, and, and you can live well, and I know that many of you know that. So mental health is, is a key factor, though, because if your mental health isn't well, then you're less likely to do the things you need to do to keep your count slow, um, to you know, just stay healthy, to uh, protect yourself during pregnancy and, and protect the health of your unborn child. So all of those things, mental health plays such a critical role. So today I'll be talking a little bit about reproductive health. Um, and what, what that means is women, we, we deal with different things as it relates to our mental health because our body goes through different changes. Um, we have periods, we get pregnant, we have to deliver and deal with what happens after we deliver. And then we also deal with going through uh, menopause. So. Uh, this will not be an exhaustive lecture because I really want you guys to have the opportunity to ask me questions. So please, you know, put questions in the chat because um, we're going to have plenty of time for more engagement and discussion. But I'm going to highlight some of the um, the times in which uh, mental health affects us across the reproductive life cycle and really just kind of highlight, you know, what is depression? Uh, so often we're walking around depressed and don't even know we're depressed and need help. So I, I want to highlight that and I want to um, share some resources for you guys as well. All right, so let's get into it. I'm going to share my screen with you all. And like I said, we'll be talking about women's mood and anxiety disorders across the reproductive life cycle. So, so depression, major depressive disorder. Um, what does that mean? You know, everyone has a bad day. You know, we, we all deal with grief and upsets and disappointments, um, breakups, loss of loved ones, loss of a job, things like that. We can all have a bad day. Um, but when that bad day becomes persistent and we start to have other symptoms, we have to be concerned about what we call major depressive disorder. And major depressive disorder is an, a mental health illness in which you have symptoms of low mood or a lack of interest in things you would normally enjoy. You know, maybe you like to typically run or um, you like catching up with your friends, you like watching a good movie, all of a sudden you don't enjoy that, that thing anymore. Um, that's a key symptom, but in addition to that, lacking enjoyment in things or interest in things and feeling sad, you might notice that your appetite is, um, has picked up. You just can't stop eating. A lot of us self-medicate with food, even when we don't realize and we start to gain weight as a, resort, uh, as a result of that self-medication. Often there's carb craving, you know, it's the sugar, it's... Um, it might even be uh, substances such as alcohol, but that appetite for those things go up or you can lose your appetite completely. There's also um, often people will either sleep more or, or can't sleep at all. So there's a sleep disturbance. People will also have what we call psychomotor agitation or 
um, retardation. What that means is the, the need to move if you're activated, like you got to tap your foot, you're feeling a little anxious all the time, or you're completely not moving. Uh, lack of energy, just feeling like you're so fatigued, like there's a weight on your shoulders that you just can't get from under. And the feelings of worthlessness or guilt, as well as the lack of ability to concentrate, you know, get through a task, um, not be so easily distracted. And sometimes in, in worst case scenarios, people will have suicidal thoughts or recurrent thoughts of death. Even if they don't plan to do anything to themselves, they might feel like, I just wish this would end. I just wish I would wake up tomorrow. So those are the symptoms of depression. It's when those symptoms are more present more often than not. You don't have to have every one of these symptoms. You can have four or five of them. And if they're present more often than not to the point where they are bothering you or impairing your ability to function during the day, to be a, a, um, a wife, a mother, a sister, an employee, that's when it's a problem. And that's what we call major depressive disorder. These symptoms, um, when you should be worried if these symptoms have been present more often than not for more than two weeks. So it doesn't take that long um, before you should be concerned. So we know that major depression is actually quite common. It affects greater than 350 million people of all ages um, in the United States. And it is a global illness. You know, It's not just the United States affected. Approximately twice as many women will have this illness um, onset compared to men. And it, depression is highly associated with suicide. Doesn't mean that just because you have it or a loved one has it that they will try to hurt themselves, but there is that risk for it, it getting worse and those, the, the idea of wanting to hurt oneself um, happening. But the great thing is that there are effective treatments for this illness. So, uh, just to kind of highlight the difference between men and women um, and bringing it back to the hormones, uh, which is my area of expertise, we have to appreciate that you can see my cursor in this little red circle here. Um, something happens, you know, we start off, girls and boys have a similar rate of depression and depression can onset pretty early in life. Uh, but something happens when we hit puberty. Uh, and that's when we start to notice differences in hormone, hormones in, in girls and boys, right? And you can have the onset of depression as early as a preteen and typically it is, um, the earliest onset is related to um, puberty and a girl getting her first period. So we know that that's when the, the difference starts to separate between men and women. We start to see a trajectory of women having um, twice as much uh, prevalence of depressive episodes than men. So we know that approximately 12 million women each year are affected by depression and that 10% of these females are greater than 12 years old um, that report depression at any given time. Um, as I mentioned, females have a higher rate to the one compared to men and that women 49 to 60 years old have a higher prevalence of depression than women 12 to 17 year, years old. And of course, there's a, a lot in between. Now, we know that it doesn't just start with uh, puberty. So we, we have the, the symptoms of um, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. We're dealing with depression onset um, starting in puberty. Um, but then what about when a woman gets pregnant? So we know that the rate of, of, of pregnancy and depression is 10 to 15% will suffer and pregnancy. A lot, of, a lot of times people think pregnancy, um, or men, I should say, I don't think women that have been pregnant would think this, but <laughs> many when, men think that pregnancy is a time of, you know, well-being, women are just happy to be pregnant. And, and, um, and it's, you know, you could have a great pregnancy uh, for sure, but often women are dealing with lots of things that are happening to their bodies. And depression is one thing that is not uncommon to onset during pregnancy. So again, remembering that 10 to 15% of women deal with this. Um, and women, of course, with a prior history of any type of mental illness, whether that's anxiety, um, depression, bipolar disorder, or something else, um, even history of trauma, can um, have are at increased risk of having an onset of depression during pregnancy. So, risk for major depression in pregnancy is difficulty getting pregnant, 
Um, being a mom to multiples, like you know, twins, tri triplets, losing a baby. Unfortunately, we know miscarriage happens so often, and even in worst case scenarios, um, someone will carry a baby almost to term and have a stillborn. Uh, both of those are very you know, upsetting situations. Uh, being a teen mom can definitely be a, a risk, having a preterm birth or other complications like that. Having a baby with a, a defect or a disability, you know, um, these days we are learning about, um, we can identify those things so much earlier, but you're still pregnant carrying this baby, knowing that they're going to be born with some type of defect or disability. Uh, of course, pregnancy and birth complications and having a baby or infant um, hospitalized are risk factors. So that leads us to postpartum though. So even if you get through pregnancy, um, you're doing great, you're, you're fine. We know that one in seven women who've never even had a history of depression or any mental illness will have an onset of postpartum depression or even postpartum anxiety. It is a major public health issue that we're trying to get a better hold on. And it's really related to hormonal withdrawal, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. Um, it has long-term effects on the child. A lot of times moms are like, well, as long as I can just kind of fight through it, I'll be okay, you know, again, not seeking the help they need or they're worried about taking medication and, and breastfeeding, but it actually um, has long-term effects on the child because it, it affects the mom's bonding and attachment. So it's very important to get help um, if you're having these symptoms postpartum. So again, one in seven women, it is, a rate of 23 to 59% in inner city and adolescent mothers. So, you know, translation, minority women are higher risk for postpartum depression. Um, it's an increased risk if you've ever been diagnosed with bipolar disorder and an increased risk in women who have history of, again, any um, uh, mental illness prior to pregnancy or even in pregnancy or even have family history. Mom, sister had uh, postpartum depression, then you definitely have a higher risk for it. So getting back to that hormonal withdrawal. Um, so this is, you know, hormonal withdrawal is, is what we know triggers this in some women. We don't know why. We believe that those women are just more uh, vulnerable in some way or have some, some different genetic makeup that um, such a drop off in hormones. You know, you go from being way up here in pregnancy, all the estrogen is holding that, that pregnancy together. And then it literally drops off a cliff like rapidly as soon as the baby comes out. And that is a trigger for some women. Um, and it actually affects a, a neurochemical called serotonin. So we know that serotonin is what helps us maintain a stable mood and is what antidepressants have in them. Um, estrogen withdrawal like that really tugs at that serotonin level and, and can cause depression and anxiety. So 25% of women who have postpartum depression develop it after subsequent births. So it's a higher risk each time they have a pregnancy. And um, of course, we know that stressful life events um, can definitely, you know, being in the pandemic, um, you know, dealing with the civil unrest, those types of things, um, but other things going on in your life can definitely help to trigger the onset of depression. Uh, being a type A personality, you might see this word neuroticism on my slide here, uh, that can, you know, having, having to deal with something you can't control can be really triggering for women who are type A in that way. So we, we have to learn to be present and let go of things we can't control. And, and as I mentioned, um, genetic factors. So um, risk factors for the postpartum depression, again, depression or anxiety during pregnancy, family history, unplanned or unwanted pregnancy. Lack of support is a huge one. And it's about having the lack of support in terms of what you individually uh, define as support. It's not about what your, your sister, your mom, your friend defines as support, it's about what you define as support. So having the right type of support is a, a major protective factor, factor actually. But having the right support means what? We have to be able to ask for help <laughs> and say when we need things. Um, and, you know, a lot of, I talk to a lot of my patients about 
you know, they're, they're planning for family to come over and see the baby. And, and I remind them that, okay, make sure you have a family that's coming over to actually help. It's not just about seeing the baby. Are they coming to help you? <laughs> Are they coming to help you, you know, get some food, clean the house, take a shower? Those are that's the type of support that a lot of women are looking for. And if, you know, if they have a, a male partner or a female partner who's in the house and um, doing those things that of course is very helpful. We know that some moms are single and they're uh, needing help just from friends and family um, to deal with the postpartum period. Of course, poor birth outcomes is a, another factor. Hello. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Someone say oh, hello. Sir. Okay, uh, so back to the risk for the baby, impaired mental and motor development is one of the uh, risk factors of um, dealing with, first of all, untreated depression or anxiety in pregnancy. Um, it actually kind of fetal programs the baby and it, um, they can come out with impaired mental and motor development. Um, and once they are postpartum, a mom who has bad anxiety or depression, the baby doesn't learn how to have an appropriate temperament. So they will have a difficult temperament um, as they develop. They don't know how to self-soothe, self-regulation um, becomes an issue. Um, and they often will have more behavioral problems and low self-esteem. And that goes back to that attachment and that engagement and lack thereof usually or in a appropriate attachment that is happening um, due to the mom having postpartum depression or anxiety. So I wanted to just highlight uh, very briefly here um, anxiety. When I talk about anxiety, I'm talking about difficulty concentrating, excessive worry. You know, when I say excessive worry, things that your friends may not even be worried about. Um, you will find yourself just kind of going over and over in your head, whether it's something that happened yesterday or you're worried about something in the future. Um, appropriate worries, of course, you know, finances, um, you know, if you lost a job, okay, yeah, you're going to worry a little bit. But if you find yourself worrying about someone just left the house and you're worried about them getting in a car accident, they've been driving for years, nah, that's an excessive worry. Um, so you have to, to, catch yourself um, about things that are, are excessive worries and they usually keep people up. They're racing thoughts because they're sitting there kind of just ruminating going over these things. So it's, it's harder to sleep or it can wake people up in, in the middle of the night and they have a hard time going back to sleep. It affects temperament in terms of irritability. That type of um, anxiety, you know, makes people just a little more, uh, less tolerant of stress and a little more quick tempered. Um, and, and too often people will self-medicate as a result using alcohol, marijuana, or other substances to try to calm, calm down. Uh, so keeping that in mind, um, anxiety being a, a thing that can pop up again during pregnancy and postpartum, as well as um, later in life and perimenopause and menopause. PTSD. Want to just highlight that because so many, uh, particularly Black women, um, have dealt with trauma, whether that's been uh, physical or sexual, um, have dealt with abuse as a child, whether, you know, physical or um, sexual. And a lot of those feelings can come back later in life at these different hormonal times, uh, particularly in pregnancy and postpartum. And it's a numbing of feelings, um, feeling detached from the world, somewhat unconnected, irritable, uh, difficulty sleeping, seeing danger everywhere, not feeling comfortable, and um, and being hypervigilant, or what we might refer to as easily startled. So now it brings us to okay, had your children, we've been postpartum, we've had periods. Now we hit another hormonal change in our life, and it's uh, perimenopause, uh, menopause, and that perimenopausal transition. At least I hear from so many. Um, family members, uh, I haven't reached that stage yet, knock on something, but uh, <laughs> I um, talk to a lot of family and friends who are in this period, in this transition. They just talk about all the symptoms that they're having. And um, this is another vulnerable time for depression or anxiety to onset. So let's talk about a little bit what it means to be um, perimenopausal versus postmenopause. Um, so we know reproductive stage of life, you're having regular periods, typically, unless there's, there's something going on um, and that lasts well into your 40s um, for many women. 
Um, so monthly periods, one, two, or 40s. When you hit perimenopause, there's three or more months of reduced or irregular periods. Um, that's really due to, again, your estrogen is changing, it's dropping. And so people will start to notice that maybe the period's not coming every 28 days or 29 days or 27 days, whatever your cycle is, and that there will be more irregularity, but maybe you're still getting periods and that, that would be an indication that you're perimenopausal. And this typically occurs in the mid forties, uh, early fifties for some women. Um, I know some women it's late fifties, early sixties. So it, it depends on your, <laughs> your individual body and your family history. But women will start to complain during the perimenopausal stage of hot flashes, um, vaginal dryness, uh, fatigue, uh, and they will even often start to complain. They can't remember things as much, so they're having a lot of what we call cognitive difficulties, um, feeling depressed, irritable, um, having difficulties with urinary continence. And postmenopause is when you haven't had a period for more than a, for at least a year or more, and that's when you've hit postmenopause. Um, and that's, that's a little different. A lot of those symptoms start to go away. It's that perimenopausal phase that people are really bothered. All these like physical and emotional symptoms are usually happening during that time. All right, so sorry. Prevalence of depressive symptoms during that time. Um, studies have shown that 45 to 68% of women who are perimenopausal will report depressive symptoms. That's, that's a huge amount. So most women are, re are reporting some symptoms. Um, and this is compared to 28 to 31% of people who have not hit the perimenopausal stage. So that's, that's a huge difference. You have a lot more onset um, in the perimenopausal stage. And then there's the domino theory, right? You know, the vasomotor symptoms of hot flushes and sleep disturbance and night sweats leads, um, leads to so much sleep disturbance that you become depressed just because of the pure annoyance and frustration with those symptoms and the sleep deprivation. So with that said, um, I wanna highlight, first of all, seeking help. If you are being bothered by symptoms that are keeping you up, not letting you enjoy life, you're dealing with excessive worry, feeling sad, and these this is happening more days than not is affecting your ability to enjoy life or get work done or be a mom or a partner. That's the time to seek help. But there are also things you can be doing besides seeing a, a seeking um, therapy or um, medication through your um, your primary care physician or a psychiatrist. You can also be doing things to try to prevent as well as um, you know, natural things to try to help yourself. And that's maintaining a daily routine, staying active, finding ways to safely connect. And I say safely because we're in the pandemic um, with family and friends every day, and as well as um, you know, eating uh, healthy meals and limiting your media. Um, and I particularly put that on because we're in this pandemic and this is time of civil unrest. And, um, and watching the news can be triggering. Uh, check in with yourself daily, focus on what you have, find ways to you know, um, embrace gratitude for the things that are going well. Um, and, and for those things that are bothering you to write them down and in a book and try to put them in, literally kind of put them on a shelf, put them in a drawer. Uh, the, decrease the time you spend, again, watching um, Unsettling Media and meditate, be mindful. If you like yoga, it's a get, great way to um, kind of reset your mind, but also focus on your spirituality uh, for those of you who are spiritual. Um, I have to highlight that the psychological effect of persistent negative emotions can lead to the onset of depression and anxiety. So if you find yourself always having negative thoughts, it's better to intervene in that early and not wait until you have depressive or anxiety symptoms. Go talk to a therapist. All right, so I've, I think I've harped on it enough. If you have feelings of persistent worry, irritability, rumination on negative thoughts, seek help, um, especially if this has been going on for more than two weeks, you're not sleeping, um, you're not eating, anything like that. You wanna contact the mental health provider. So see, these are some resources. Uh, many of you may have heard of Taraji P. Henson. So she started the, Bo the Boris Lawrence Henson Foundation. Um, over the past year, she's been doing a lot to um, provide services 
uh, for, for women uh, seeking therapy. But we have these two major national organizations who have Chicago chapters. This is NAMI, um, National Association of Mental Illness and the DBSA, Depression Bipolar Support Alliance. Um, they can usually connect people with resources as well. Therapy for Black Girls is a great resource, um, again, for to get a therapist. Sister, uh, Sister Al Alfia is here in Chicago and um, a great community organization. And then we have Black Emotional and Mental Health. Um, anyone dealing with um, domestic violence, interpersonal violence, such as sexual assault resilience is another um, great organization who has um, offices in the Austin community. So those are just a few. And with that said, I, um, I'll turn it over to questions. I wanna hear from you guys. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Julia, I can't hear you. I see you. I think you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, okay. That was a great presentation, Dr. Clark. That was very, very helpful. And I even like the added resources. I didn't know it was so many. I mean, yeah. it's like every year, hopefully there's improvement. And that's what this uh, program is all about. It's about improving the access to healthcare as it relates mm -hmm. to Black women. So as we have more discussions, you know, like the one that you just gave, as well as those resources, we will be armed with the right resources to in mental health or to get treatment for mental health. So I'd like to thank you. Thank you. But go ahead, um, Brittany, Dr. Martin, she's going to go ahead. All right, great. So earlier you had um, talked about um, like postpartum de the depression in a lot of great detail. How do you think mothers should approach the conversation with like their partners, their family, if they start to feel like they have those symptoms? Yeah, no, it's a great question, especially uh, I think in some communities such as such as um, the black community. You know, I I can't tell you how many times I've had to kind of bring a family in because no one believes that anything is wrong they're like hey she's just gotta she just gotta pull it together she's gonna be okay we're gonna pray about it. um so you know i tell the the woman you know definitely show them some resources or let them know i'm not i'm not doing well um i recommend they seek the help they need and and bring the the family in to meet that professional i um because I, I do think it's helpful to hear from another person um too often the woman will be trying to advocate for herself but she's she's already not feeling well and um and it's hard to you know she's trying to figure out well is it me or am i you know am i tripping um or is something really wrong and I, if a woman is feeling like she needs to seek help, she should seek help and then try to bring her family in to meet that provider and get more education about it after she gets the help um, or connects with someone. All right, that's perfect. And as far as, you know, resources, do you think um, COVID is going to play like a, a really big uh, role in uh, some of the, the issues that you brought up earlier? Yeah, so it has already played a big role. Um, first of all, I'll start with number one, it's played a big role in mental health in the terms of people feeling depressed or, or anxious and, and for real reasons, right? You know, we've got people who've lost their jobs who um, are heavily stressed by trying to uh, deal with finances as well as e-learning and, and still going to work every day while they have a child at home. Um, you know, and then there's the loss of loved ones, right? The, which has disproportionately affected uh, the black and Hispanic communities. So there's a lot going on. People have real reasons to be feeling appropriately stressed. But when that, that stress starts to bleed into um, them feeling like they're not going to make it. They are having more trouble keeping up with their own day-to-day -day activities. It's still, even with appropriate stress, it's still the time to go in and seek help. So we're, we're seeing a lot of people struggling right now, a lot more people seeking out for mental health providers, a lot more people who are um, 
seeking, um, you know, mental provider, health providers that look like them. And, and so I'm seeing a lot of that, but then you add on a woman who is uh, pregnant or postpartum, uh, you know, that whole landscape has changed. You know, you can't go deliver a baby and have everybody come and meet you at the hospital and, and wait for you to deliver and, and meet the baby. Um, recently, they started letting one, the, the partner back into the room because uh, that, that wasn't the case for a minute there. Um, and you might, depending on the hospital, may be able to have one more uh, visitor over the course of the pregnancy, but it was really rough. A lot of women were delivering by themselves. Um, and if you have COVID, then you can't take the baby home. So there, that has been a major stressor. Um, so yeah, it, it has, COVID has really changed the landscape and has changed how well. So I talked about support, right? And that need for having family and friends to help. Well, you know, now family and friends are scared to come over. You're scared to have them over because, you know, everyone's trying to protect themselves from COVID or if family lives further away. Um, flying is a risk of, to of getting COVID infection. So we're finding some some new moms dealing with having to navigate more by themselves and not having the support they really need because everyone's trying to protect themselves from the virus. All right. And then this isn't a, a question, but uh, I'm just going to um, share Ms. Good's comment. Mm -hmm. So she says, you know, I learned a lot definitely when you spoke about depression starting as young as teen years. I feel both my daughters experienced that in teen years, but not knowing how to address it or get help definitely is a major problem uh, with my girls growing up. It wasn't really a question, but I think that is kind of like a really good topic as far as um, teens. Are there certain things that we could sort of like look for or try to identify in our, our teens or children as like early signs of depression? Yeah, no, great question. It definitely presents differently in teens. And um, what I often tell parents to look for is them becoming more withdrawn or increasingly irritable. Uh, definitely acting out and, you know, every team is going to do their testing or whatever, uh, try to, you know, do what they want to do. But acting out and, you know, just excessively is a concern. Um, again, the irritability and or being more withdrawn, all of those things. If they start using substances excessively, you got to wonder, you know, is this a, you know, what's, what's driving it? You know, is this them just trying to have fun or is this trying, them trying to self-medicate? And, and too often um, the behavior of self-medicating goes unchallenged uh, and, you know, it's assumed to be, you know, they're just trying to have fun and for whatever reason they're choosing to drink or whatever or, or smoke. And often it's really them trying to help themselves feel better. So those are important things to look out for. And there's plenty of... Um, child and adolescent therapists and, and psychiatrists around. And it's, I try to tell people it's never a bad thing to just like we get an annual or should get an annual checkup, uh, should see our gynecologist once a year or every couple of years for that pap smear. It's never a bad thing to go in and just get a mental health assessment. It's like, okay, I'm concerned that there's a, if, if at any point you say like, mm, I'm not sure, something seems off here, it's okay to take your child or yourself to get a mental health assessment. No one's like gonna force you to continue uh, care if you don't need it. So, so that's just food for thought there. Yeah, that's perfect. That's, that's really fantastic information. I know there are a lot of uh, mothers on this, on this webinar right mm -hmm. now. And Mary, um, she brought up uh, something really interesting. So she says, we as Black women do not wish to be deemed as crazy if we seek help. Is there some way to overcome the stigma that we're crazy? And I'm going to throw in this phrase too, like angry Black women. Yes, yes. No, that, that's a real issue, right, in the Black community. We are, we are like determined, like no one's going to be labeling us. Um, and we, and we, pride ourselves in identifying with being strong black women, but to be strong does not mean to forego your mental health. That is, <laughs> that is part of your strength is like keeping your, your mental health together, um, not foregoing yourself so that you can try to save face to uh, the white community or your friends or your employers or whomever. And so getting past that stigma, that's 
you know, it, it is easier said than done. I, I will say that first. But I just try to remind my Black women that, you know, it's really about, like when you get on the plane, it's really about putting the oxygen mask on yourself first, you know, and until you do that, you cannot be the caregiver for mom and dad, the mom of your children, working for your employer, um, doing all these things for your friends and family, which is what we tend to take on. We just take it all on. And before we know it, we're like drowning. Um, barely making it. So put the oxygen uh, mask on yourself first. And it's it's not, it is not crazy. So I, I hate that word. I use the word only when I'm talking about people who know better. Uh, <laughs> um, so I, there it is nothing crazy about being depressed or being anxious. Uh, that, it, that does not deem you as crazy. That does not mean you should be institutionalized or not have your children or anything. That just means you have what we call a chemical imbalance that needs to be addressed. And if, if you will go to the doctor to address your blood pressure, go to the doctor to address a broken bone, diabetes, um, having a baby, then there's no reason you can't go to the doctor to address your brain health. This is, this is your brain. Your brain affects every other part of your body. So if your brain's not right, you're gonna have problems with your heart. You're gonna have problems, you know, it just goes on. You'll probably um, develop other ailments that um, need to be treated because your brain health isn't together. So th just think of it as another organ that has to be uh, healthy and that sometimes you need medication to help it stay healthy. So I, I, I encourage people to reframe how they think about mental health and, um, and, about, and about mental wellness because it's not, it doesn't mean you're crazy because you um, are having you know, uh, an episode, so to speak. And, and you're please, gonna. I was just gonna say, please ask me more about that because that, that is an important point and and a, a real issue for our community. But go ahead, Brittany. Oh yeah, I was gonna say. Now you're getting like a ton of questions, so I'm gonna try to <laughs> squeeze in you know, if it's okay with you. Maybe it, maybe oh, yeah. at least three more questions. Yeah, um, yeah. So um, actually, I'm gonna. Um, Actually, this question. So we had, we actually have a special guest. Dr. Raheem Young is here. He's the the co-founder of Welcome to Fatherhood, and he wants to know how should men best support their partners during this time. Oh, I love that question. Um, so I'm really and get out and get into this because I um, thought I was speaking to mostly women. So. Uh, but I do work with fathers and I do feel it's very important for fathers to be a part of, um, to be looped in and be a part of the journey uh, back to mental wellness uh, for that, that woman. Um, and there's also a such thing, uh, many people don't know this, but there's a such thing as uh, postpartum depression for men as well. They're, they're also having their own hormonal changes as women are going through theirs and we have this new baby in the house and they're also feeling the stress of being left out sometimes and um, just not knowing how to help and, and feeling very isolated and vulnerable in that regard as well. I, so I would first say the, the man has to check himself and make sure he's doing okay, but also uh, really being there for that woman and, um, you know, validating her feelings and concerns, you know, this does not make her a bad person because she's, you know, having some emotional distress at this time. This is very common, unfortunately too common. Um, so uh, validating that, helping her find the help she needs, but also providing that support, you know, help her to get some sleep, let her know that you got it. You, I can, I can, I can change diapers, you know, I can feed the baby. <laughs> I can do some of these things. So often women, um, you know, feel like they got to do it on their own. And so they start to push the man out like, no, I got, you know, you don't know what you're doing now. I'm going to change the diaper. You don't know what you're doing. I'm going to feed the baby. And before they know it, well, the man isn't doing anything because they've been told not to do anything. So let her know that you you can help push to help don't don't um, give in to the uh, the redirection of no I got this but actually yeah no no I want to help no I want you to sleep for hours you you pump I can I can at least do one of these feedings while you're sleeping those types of things are very helpful and um, and just like I said and also checking your own mental health at that time so that you can stay a, a grounded support 
Uh, so if I can stay at ground of support for that woman, it would be helpful. Hope that answers the question. But yeah, I got lots of thoughts there too. <laughs> Yeah, that was perfect. I think that's a really great answer. And, I, and I'll just throw this little piece in there. As a, as a mother of three toddlers under the age of three, um, definitely let people help you. It's, it's very important. Um, and that kind of goes in, in tandem with Gina's question, um, which is more, how do, how do you ask for help? Um, not, you know, most people come over to visit the baby, but how do you really sit them down and say, you know, could you wash some dishes or change some diapers? How do you, how would you engage in that conversation? Yes, you know, and, and this is a journey that many women um, and definitely black women have to, uh, you know, journey we're on learning how to be like, learning to know that it's not, you're not weak for asking and you're not weak for saying what you need. Um, that is, that is, there's strength there, there's power there and, you know, and empowering yourself to do so. So I would, I would first say when that person is saying they're going to come over, think about what you need. I, could you bring some food with you? <laughs> you know, just ask. Um, and when they get there, um, and they want to goo goo gaga over the baby, you know, be direct. Hey, I really haven't, I haven't taken a shower. Could you watch the baby while I take a shower? Um, you know, you can also have a lot of, the, really, you can have a lot of these conversations before they ever get there. It'd be great if you could come over and watch the baby while I take a nap. Would you be able to do, you know, would that be okay? It doesn't have to be, you know, this could be a nice question, not trying to be contentious with anybody, but just having, um, I, I recommend having the conversation before they even get there, letting them know what you need, what would be helpful, what they could bring, and, you um, what you're really, you know, struggling with. I haven't got a chance to clean the house. Um, you think, would you mind helping me when you come over? Um, and then you have to see who really helps, you know, and, and that person who comes over and doesn't do any of the things that you said you needed help with, maybe you'll need to keep having them over until you're at a point where, <laughs> you know, it doesn't, you're not concerned about those things anymore, but keep having the people over that are willing to help and and be okay and not beat yourself up about needing that help or asking for what you need and some people may be like they might they may not feel you and may not want to help and that's okay they don't need to come up all right perfect and we have our final question we're going to give that over to deandra she yeah. says I am a 50-ish year old woman and I have been going through menopause and experiencing depression. However, I am functional. Um, mm -hmm. When I go to work, I maintain my household, but I feel that I am ready to snap and pop at any time. What should I do? I strongly recommend if, if this has not already been pursued, seeking therapy and, and possibly even a psychiatrist. Um, you know, you might even start by talking with your gynecologist first, you know, there are hormonal treatments if, if that's something, um, depending on your personal health history, if that's something that would be safe for you and that you're willing to take. Um, but beyond that, you know, many of our psychiatrists um, are used to dealing with this particular phase of life and, and working through therapy, um, which does not require medication about those things that got you about to pop and and are frustrating um, is very important. And it's not uncommon to be functional. Um, and I'm glad you bring that up. So many people are functionally depressed and anxious, not uncommon at all. Again, not uncommon for black women because we're always trying to push through. So uh, that doesn't mean you don't need help or that you couldn't feel better as you're already describing. So, you know, seek the help. Um, and I, I would definitely, even if you know you choose to do hormonal therapy, I would still uh, get a therapist who can just help to process some of those things and help you develop other coping skills to, to work through this time. Okay, thank you. I, I have a question. You know, and my entry that I know is it's very sketchy. So, but uh, so bear with me. Uh, mm -hmm. For if a woman was HIV positive and she was taking her HIV meds, then all of a sudden, you know, now all of a sudden she has a mental breakdown where she's on HIV, HIV meds and mental health medicine. Do they coincide? I mean, does they contradict or what should a woman do? Should she take her HIV meds first or should she take uh, a mental health medicine first? Yeah, no, great question. Most of them do not um, interact. 
So mm -hmm. there's no problem with taking the taking at the same time if you want to. Mm -hmm. Most of them um, do not interact at all, but I will always check with the doctor prescribing them, you know, and make they should know what all of your medications are um, so that they can make sure that there aren't any interactions that, you know, wouldn't be obvious. Um, and it's something I do with my patients all the time. Um, I have plenty of, of patients on um, um, proteas inhibitors and other things, um, heart regimens. And um, yeah, I pretty much, I just go through double check, mm -hmm. but most of them don't interact. So it's, it's usually fine. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brittany. All right. So Dr. Clark, do you have any um, final thoughts or comments that you want to leave with our audience today? Yeah, only, um, you know, I, I can't reinforce it enough uh, that we have to take care of ourselves and that uh, the more we take care of ourselves, ourselves mentally, um, the more we will be better physically and the longer lives and happier lives. I'm all about living my best life. So mental mental health helps you live your best life. So I, I can't stress how important it is to um, to take care of it. And, you know, I know in the churches so often, we have more pastors, thank God, today who are really preaching about mental health and embracing it in, in new and more progressive ways. But we still have some people of the old guard who are like, well, just pray about it. But if you wouldn't pray about your broken leg without going to see a doctor, don't just pray about your mental health. Pray that you find a good provider who's going to help you get better and that they can be that vessel through God to help you. But don't just pray about it and leave it alone. Um, seek the help you need. There are plenty of us out here uh, telemedicine is an opportunity right now, so you don't have to necessarily go in to see anybody. Many people are um, seeing people remotely, so you don't have to see, see that as a barrier. And um, yeah, and I, I will provide these resources that I show on the slides to um, Juliet and, and Brittany so that they can be passed out. So I, um, I wish you all Oh, I was saying that's really nice of you. Thank you so much, Dr. Clark. Yeah, no problem. And then I do, I do want to remind the audience that this is a, a 12 month program and uh, it's going to run every third Thursday at 3 p.m. Central Time. And Julia will talk more about it. But next month, we're actually going to facilitate a panel discussion on self care. And we're going to be inviting physicians, um, mental health counselors, entrepreneurs, women from uh, different walks of life so that we can talk about balance. Oh, I love it. I love it. I may have to check in on that one. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're, we're going to definitely extend the invitation back out to you. Okay. That would be wonderful. And people can find me uh, also at Northwestern. Um, I have a couple other uh, colleagues of color and... Um, and on Instagram, that Dr. Crystal listens, where I occasionally throw out some pearls of um, mental health wisdom. So, thank you, thank you, Dr. Clark. You know, I love the fact that you said brain health. You know, take care of your brain. I think I like that better than the mental health. And mm -hmm. so it makes you think. Now, you know, it makes you think. Oh, I'm not crazy. You know, so yeah. take away that it reduces the stigma as well. You know, I, I have this phrase: "Is are you ready?" You know, we can complain all we want about health care and in the in the system but we have to be advocates you know self advocacy helps and getting that message out that you gave us does arm us to be that so that we can reduce some of the uh, systemic racism that's going on uh within the healthcare system and also other systems so i like to thank you and that's what this is about. We're trying to transform policies by being advocates, by being at the table with, with Black medical providers like yourself so that we can uh, learn from each other as well. So I'd like to thank you. And on the behalf of Chicago Department of Public Health, I would like to thank you for reaching out to us for our 12-month series, Our Power, Our Voice, Our Control. It's a for you, for us, and by us um, takeaway messaging on a monthly basis. So I would like to thank you, uh, Dr. Clark. I'd like to thank you, Dr. Brittany Martin. And Universal Family Connection, we like to extend uh, our gratitude towards the people that tuned in to the webinar. And thank you very much. So we all gonna have that, that great brain health by taking care of self first, you know, taking care of your brain. I like that. 
and we have plenty of resources. So we'll make sure that everyone gets those resources. Thank you. Thank all you. Right. Thank you so much for having me. It's been an honor and a privilege. So you all take care. Thank you. Brittany. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close this out. And then for anyone uh, who missed the portion of this, we will be uh, editing and uploading this to various platforms. So we'll, we'll keep you guys updated about that via email. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. See you guys soon. Okay. Stay safe, everyone. All right. Bye.